to learn about finite state machines. As we've seen, for the software point of view, Verilog or any HDL language can be a little bit full of traps. Creating logic, where, for instance, a variable can change inside uh, in the next uh, edge of the clock, and your if, for instance, cannot be the same as you're thinking that it is, but is going to be updated in the next tick of the clock, can present a lot of um, a lot of difficulties, a lot of traps when you are developing it. Okay, so the motivation about using finite state machines is to be the recipe, a structure for every time that you want to create a logic that is a little bit more complex. So the next design that you do, if you are, uh, if you have a logic a little bit more complex, for instance, you create an I2 square transceiver, or you are creating something that, uh, for instance, the AXI protocol that we're going to see in next videos. So use a state machine is the best way okay is the most structured way to create uh, a logic a little bit more complex in fpgas okay uh, i'm going to switch to the board to show a little bit more about the structure of uh, of finite state machines i'm going to say, uh, speak a little bit about the types of state machines that there are and how to implement them in very long hope you guys like it and let's switch to the board and let's go Okay guys, so let's take a look in the finite state machines, okay? As a normal digital circuit, it has inputs and outputs, but we're going to focus what we have inside. The finite state machine can be divided in three parts, two combination logical parts and one sequential part, okay? This first, the, this first combination, combinational part here is going to be the one who is going to uh, calculate the next state based on the inputs and in the current state, okay? This part here is going to be the part that is going to memorize or store the current state. And this part here is going to be the part that is going to calculate the output depending on the, on the current states or the input states as well, in the case of the Mili state machine. Okay? State machines can, can be in two flavors, Mili or Moore. Okay? In the case of the Mili, is this case here, where the output is going to be a function of the current state and the input, okay? And in the Moore, the output will be a function only of the current state. What are the real difference between them? In the case of the Mili, uh, if you create a, a, a state machine that are in this type, Mili is probably going to be faster by one state, okay? If you do the same state machine in the Moore, it's going to be one state more slow, and uh, the advantage is that the Moore can be simpler to implement, okay? Uh, it's going to use one state more, but it's simpler. Okay, guys? Now we're going to switch how to... Ah, before, before that, this normally this combination part here that is going to calculate the next state is always sequential, okay? Here is where you want to put your logic. The logic of your algorithm will be here. Okay, and normally this is a case state with a full of states that, uh, that is going to be calculated. And here is just a group of assigns, kind of like a MOOCs. Like if the state is this, assign to the output the value A or B or C, whatever. Just don't forget to put the default case, otherwise, you are going to create a lag. Okay, now I'm going to switch to a very simple state machine, will be a Moore type and how we can uh, implement it in Verilog. Okay guys, this is a very simple sample that I found in one of the MIT courses about digital design and this is a circuit called Level to Pulse Converter, okay? It's a quite simple finite state machine of the type Moore and it has three states, okay? It has an input, the level, and the output is going to be a, a pulse detection. Oh, sorry, a level detection. So, how this circuit works? It has three states, okay? Uh, again, the inputs are going to be L, the output is going to be P, and the circuit will start after the reset in this state here, okay? It's going to be in the state weight. While it's on the state weight, the output P will be equal to zero, and if the, uh, the, the input is zero, it's going to remain on this state. But if the variable L go to 1 is going to go to the state edge de detect, okay? And, this, and, and in this state, the output P will be equals to 1. 
if the the level go to zero, it's going to go back again to the state weight, okay? But if the if the input L is still one, it's going to go to the state weight fall, okay? In this state weight fall, the output will be zero, and we're going to remain in this state weight fall while L equals one. But if L equals zero, it's going to go to the state weight again. And that's how we convert the level to the tools. Okay? Now we're going to see how to we're going to switch to the lab and we're going to implement exactly this circuit. Well, uh, but before that, we are going to just talk a little bit on how we encode these states. Okay? Let's talk a little bit on how we encode our states. In the previous example, we showed the level to pulse converter which has three states. Okay? Here is the syntax on how we're going to encode the states. We're going to use the one hot mode, okay, which by the way use more flip flops but maps well in the FPGA. And the one hot is quite simple. In every state, just one bit will be one. Okay, so in the state weight, the bit one will be this guy here. In the in the state edge detect, the one will be here. In the state weight fall is going to be here. Okay, here we're using a new. Uh, uh, a new keyword is called a local param. It's a way to define parameters that are going to be local in your module. Okay? Let's now switch to the lab to see how we can write the, the previous state machine in Verilog. Okay, with Vivado open, we start a new project to create our state machine. Okay? It has as inputs reset clock and, uh, and the level L and its output the pulse P. Now, let's create our source, our very log source. Uh, by the way, the, we can use the wizard that uh, we can start to add already our ports. So, as we're not going to use a lot of bus, this can be helpful. Okay, now let's just create our variables to hold the current state and the next state. We're going to use to encode our states the one hot encoding where we we have just one bit, one and the other zeros. So if you have three states, we need three bits. The this type of uh, of encoding of states is suitable for FPGAs because we have a lot of flip flops in the FPGA and uh, this way we can we can synthesize better. We're just following a recommendation from Zions. Maybe from Altera or the FPGAs, this can change a little bit. So, as said before, the first part is uh, always combinational block, and this is where we're going to have a huge switch case where we're going to add the logic on the, on the next state logic. So, basically, uh, we are in this state, for instance, uh, weight rise, and what will happen to go to the next state or to remain in the current state. So this is basically where we add the logic of our state machine. Okay, this can be complex like a CPU read the code and fetch and or simple as a, as our as our three state state machine. Okay? Uh, well, the the next part is the sequential part is where we actually are going to create the sequential circuit, the sequential always block that is going to store our current our current state. By the way, our current state is going to be updated with the next state variable at every rising edge of our clock. And now we are just adding, we are copying and paste by the way, our uh, our last combinational part that is going to calculate our output. In our case, we are using a more state machine, which means that our output depends only in the current state. 
And uh, by the way, you have the more and melee, and uh, melee is a little bit better because it can be faster. But more can be simple. You, you can see that you can do the all the logic with a simple assign. Okay, and here I just showing the block diagram of a uh, of a stick machine. So uh, here we have the, in red the the next state combinational part. Okay, uh, in the other side we have the output part. And the first one that we shown is the sequential part that is going to store the states. Okay, this is just to remind you what is a state machine. So let's close it now, and uh, now we need to create our test bench. The the test bench is already created, so let's just take a look, and uh, it's quite simple. So uh, here we doing following the same recycle. We instantiate our device on the test, we create a clock. Here we are adding using the monitor statement, which is not cool because it's going to print out every time that the signal changes. So it's nice to, to track where the, in which time and when the, uh, a signal is changing. Okay, so here we're just doing the reset. Okay, uh, just to help you out, we are putting some comments here. And, uh, well, we start by assigning L equals 1. Then we, a, we wait for a negative edge of the clock. Okay. Then, uh, we, before we finish, we just wait some ticks of the clock, some falling edges of the clock. By the way, here, we, we are calling a task, which can be imagined as a function. Uh, the idea here is that we want to display uh, a message in which state you are currently in. So we create an always block that is going to be executed every time that the state changes and this always block is going to call a task which is going to actually print the state that we are. So this will help because uh, when we run the simulation we can see in which state we, we are and in which time. Okay, so I'm going to change now to the, uh, to the waveform and there we can see that our state machine really created uh, converted a pulse to a level. So if L equals 1, is going to be detected and uh, MP, uh, our output P will actually pulse. So this is the basic stuff about state machines. Uh, the next video we are going to talk a little bit more about FIFOs and uh, but important point to remember, if you have a complex logic, use state machines. Don't try to program in a normal programming way. By the way, before we finish the video, I'm going to show a very, very common mistake. I'm going to switch back to the to the always combinational part that is going to decide the next part of the logic. And I'm just going to change the assignment to be, instead of, blo uh, of blocking assignment, we're going to break our circuit to put a non-blocking assignment. And nothing will work out. Basically because the no the the non blocking assignment will be scheduled that the signal will get a value in the end of the always block. So basically we are overriding everything that is uh, working in our case statement. But this is a very common mistake and it's something that uh, sometimes you just don't you just don't look that oops I changed the the operator and uh, this can make you lose some some hours of the buggy. Okay? So, an, another tip, if you are creating a combination of always block, use always blocking assignment. Okay? Blocking assignments for combination of always blocks and non-blocking assignments for sequential always blocks. Okay? I'm just putting a comment to help you guys remember that. And uh, in some moments I'm going to run the simulation and you guys will see what will happen. So let's run the simulation with our predicted bug. And uh, well, let me just expand the, the waveform. And you see that the P does not change at all. So uh, as I said, the, the, our case statement, statement was completely overrided by the non-blocking part. So we are always at this state, wait, rise, wait, rise, kind of forever. Okay, guys. So let's call the day off. And I uh, hope you guys like it. The next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about FIFOs. And uh, 
which is a very important circuit as well. Okay, guys, see you guys in the next video.